Okay, we are with the uh, inimitable, unmistakable, still young looking Mr. Barry Hearn at Shea Hearn here in uh, Deepest Darkest Essex. Barry, as always, you're looking chipper. How's life? It's enjoyable. Uh, it's busy. I am failing miserably in my attempt to retire. I think I might give up that attempt. I'm enjoying myself too much. No, I don't think you. I don't think you've ever looked up the word retirement in a dictionary. I certainly couldn't spell it, but uh, <laughs> it's it's interesting time. I'm I'm taking a little bit more time, do a little bit more fishing, yeah, which relaxes me anyway. So that's sort of two words with one stone. Um, but my business is good, and opportunity exists. And when you see opportunity, well, it's it's not something I can walk away from. So. They're stuck with me, I'm afraid. You've got to take it. Uh, quick updates whilst, uh, whilst we're here. The world of boxing, it looks like uh, Fury and Music have finally looks like it. got, yeah. it, got good. it on. Good, that's a great fight. It is, and, and boxing, we need these fights, don't we? We need the top guys fighting the top need them, guys. But people have got to understand this is a different world. Yeah. Because when we're talking about the top end of heavyweights, we're not talking about two boxers fighting each other. We're talking about two multi-millionaires fighting each other. And that gives those fighters the choice that perhaps in the past they haven't had when they're earning good money but not life-changing money. Suddenly, they really are in control of their own destiny. I actually love it like that. I think they've, they've earned the right. But the public have got to understand that the fighter doesn't do anything necessarily for the public. He does it for himself. It's not easy either, either by the way. When all said and done, when the, when the bell goes, it's just the two in the ring, yes, isn't it? Absolutely. But there's a lot more involved. If we can throw in the golf context of the Ryder Cup, an event where people don't get paid produces strangely more pressure than at the normal events where they, they are earning prize money. And similarly in boxing, it's also a battle of the egos. You know, the Gypsy King doesn't want to lose his unbeaten status within his society. Of course, they're making more money than, than you or I will see in our lifetime. But at the same time, it's that passion that wants to be the best they can be. And that's why they are where they are. So we've got to take the rough with the smooth. Fights don't happen as quickly as fans want, but the fans' wishes are secondary to those wishes of those multi-millionaires that put the gloves on. As you well know, better than most, in boxing sometimes, it isn't a simple, well, he's better than him, so he's going to win. It's about yeah, styles, it's isn't it? It's, but having seen Usyk close up twice with, with your man, AJ, mm. um, who's your money on for Fury Usyk? Well, I mean, it's on Usyk, is it? I think he's the best out there, technically. There's, the one doubt in my mind is Usyk's size and whether Tyson Fury can bully him by you know, laying on him or tiring him out. But I'm, I'm such an Usyk fan. I, I, listen, I, I believe that Tyson Fury is the number one everywhere in the world. But he has to get past Usyk to cement that position. And Usyk has the chance to become the number one everywhere in the world. He's beaten Joshua, which Tyson Fury hasn't. I'm not saying that's essential, but it would help to cement the legacy. But as we stand, styles make fights. I think Usyk will be too clever for Tyson Fury. Really? You mentioned AJ. Where is AJ right now? In a state of confusion because we're trying. We thought we had a great fight lined up in Saudi. Um, AJ against Deontay Wilder. Doesn't look as if that's going to happen in Saudi. And obviously with the Fury fight, that's going to be in Saudi. So the boxing division led by my son Eddie has got to think again. But it is a fight that both fighters want. And if it doesn't happen in the Middle East, I can see that happening possibly in Las Vegas next year. Mm. That's a fight, and you'd think it wouldn't last a distance, you'd think, because well, they can both punch. Well, I don't think there's any way it lasts a distance, no way. And I think, although I'm an AJ man, I think it's a 50 50 fight. They're both, they are the two heaviest punchers in the heavyweight division, without doubt. And it's a toss of a coin fight. I think. I'm going towards AJ, not just because of my heart, but because I think the way he's boxing now, he's fighting a different type of fight. He's not having the tear-ups that he had in the early part of his career, which were so exciting and which made his reputation. He's a much more thorough fighter now. And we've seen in the last couple of fights, 
not sensationally exciting, but very methodical, very business-like, waiting for the right opportunity. And when that opportunity comes, as Helene has found out, he punches very, very hard. I mean, but while to Joshua, whoever lands the clean punch wins mm. the fight. AJ could do with a fight and he could do with that win as well, I guess. I, I think a lot of people have probably, fairly or unfairly, slightly written AJ off. Um, yeah. After the Usyk fight, Fury's yeah. gone on, other people have moved on. Um, and obviously you're closer to AJ than nearly anybody, uh, pretty much anybody. Um, and I guess if he were to do the business with Wilder, he'd be right back in the game. Yeah, I think it? the problem you've got is, you know, we have this routine of it's important to be undefeated while you're learning. AJ actually learned very much faster than anybody else because he was thrown into a lot of very regular high-risk fights. Yeah. And he came through them, so naturally he's the country's hero. But we do have a habit in this country of building our heroes up to knock them down. Usyk, first fight against Usyk, I thought AJ was disappointing in his tactics. Second fight, much, much closer, it was a split decision, but Joshua was devastated by the second loss because he, he felt he boxed the best he could box, which is a compliment to Usyk. But you know, we've got a situation with the heavyweights now where it's a bit like Leonard Hagler, Duran Hearns. You've got Fury, you've got Deontay Wilder, you, you, you've got Joshua, you've got Usyk. Those four could really fight each other over the next three years and they'd all be massive fights because on their day, people will make adjustments when they learn things, but on their day, they're all very capable. So they could beat each other just as the four kings did. Well, you, you find that. I mean, does, does Joshua be Fury? I think he's got a great puncher's chance of being Fury. Uh, but Fury's smart. Does Fury be, you know, he's already dealt with Deontay Wilder mm. viciously. So they've had a couple of fights. There's no way that's going to happen again. Usyk is the, is the loose coin in the pocket because this guy is technically brilliant. Brilliant. And I love the way his feet works. I love the way he closes the ring down. I love the way he doesn't take that many chances. But it hits, it's hard. He's not a concussive puncher like AJ or Deontay. But if you can't lay a punch on the other man, it doesn't matter how much of a puncher you are. And Fury goes backwards a lot. And that Usyk will sensibly close him out, I think, for a fairly conclusive point to win. Really? Well, it'll be fascinating mm. to see. And I guess boxing always needs a strong heavyweight, uh, heavyweight we, we division, need stories. doesn't it? We need stories. And the heavyweight division leads from the front. Joshua has done his bit. I think Joshua has done more to put the heavyweight position in the public gaze than anybody for, for years and years, going back to Mike Tyson before people were that interested in heavyweights. But when you come down the line, we have to look at where's the other stars in this in this strange world. Conor Ben, good performance on his comeback. Does he have a massive fight? Does he, is he in the shadows waiting to come out as the next big thing? And if not, who else? Mm. And I see, I see a, a lot of gaps, a lot of opportunities for people without those shoes being filled. Do you see any of the almost second tier, the next group of heavyweights uh, promoting themselves into the the Premier League of those four fighters we've just discussed. So we we say Jang, we say Dubois, we say maybe Joyce, although that was a bad loss for him. Any others, or, or at the moment, are those four rather like you know the tennis? Remember the, uh, the uh, yeah. Djokovic, Federer, yeah, Nadal, and Murray, and there was nobody really touching them. Is that a similar thing in boxing? Yes, I think there is. I think you know Joyce has been exposed yeah. a little. He's a lovely guy. Very great, you know, great fighter, but we're talking about levels. Mm. Dubois has been exposed, really. I mean, he's had his chance, but uh, he's young enough to come again. Yep. I think we have to look at years. You know, Joe Joyce is I don't know, 38, 37, something like that. Yeah. Uh, Dubois is still, I'm thinking, somewhere around 25. Yep. You know, there is potential for Dubois to learn and to move forward. And of course, vacancies will happen, same as in tennis. You know, when Federer decided to pack up, some kid from Spain came along and mm. slotted in, didn't they? Mm. And sport works like that. You know, we all say, oh, what would happen in snooker if Ronnie O'Sullivan wasn't there? Mm. Let me tell you what would happen. Someone would walk into those shoes. Mm. That's the natural evolution of sport. Mm. 
You mentioned snooker. We'll return to boxing in a second, but the whole sports story of Barry Hearn, Matchroom, etc., it does begin with snooker. Tell us how you, you, you got into snooker, because it was like most things in life. It, it was slightly by, by accident. Totally. And the thing about you is, you, you like all of us, you know, it wasn't planned. When you saw the opportunity, you took it. I think most people get opportunities in life. Most people get that little bit of luck in life. A lot of them don't take advantage of it, and that's the real difference. I mean, if you, if you, show, if you show me a bone in the room, I'm, I'm the dog that's not going to release that bone to anyone else, if you like. And I'm, I'm going to go through whatever I have to get through to achieve that. So snooker for me was a business venture. In 1974, I was sitting in my office and my accountants rung up and said, Are you? the company I was working for was looking to diversify into other activities. And my accountants rung up and said, are you still looking for opportunities? I said, yes. He said, well, we had this... Uh, Chain of snooker was for sale, one of our clients wants to sell. It took 10 months, eventually we acquired it, and because I acquired it, I was made the chairman of the company, for whatever reason. Being as I'm sports mad and I look at a company like that, which dies in July and August, because no one plays snooker in the sunshine, because there's no air conditioning in those days, I thought, well, we need to do some tournaments to generate some interest. And we started the Lucania National, named after the chain, and players came from all over the place. And my rule was you can play if you play twice a week. Because I'm not giving you a thousand pounds for nothing. And lo and behold, the good Lord waved his magic wand and this little ginger boy turned up at Romford and said, can I play in your competition, Mr. Hurd? The ginger kid with Steve Davis, the rest is history. 81, he wins a world title, my life changes. And suddenly I've got an asset that my entrepreneurial skills say I can exploit. That was my bit of luck. There was another piece of luck as well, wasn't there? Black and white TV becomes well, colour TV? Amazingly, when I started the negotiations to buy the chain of snookles, there was no television. By the time I was finished the negotiations, the BBC had decided to go on TV and change the whole sport. So that was an enormous loss. I had people in my own company saying to me, you're a genius, how did you spot this? <laughs> I took all the credit, but yeah. of course it was a pure... Perfect for colour TV, perfect vehicle for yeah, colour TV snooker, because you can see actually the colour ball of the balls well, now. Remarkably, it started in black and white in 1969. <laughs> I mean, you can't get your head around that, can you? And Ted Lowe's famous commentary, you know, for those of you, for those of you with black and white TV, the yellow's behind the green. I mean, you can't write these things. But you do need those chunks of life. As I say, I got the, the phone call at the right time. We were ready to expand. I got the fact that the BBC suddenly turned snooker into the nation's favourite sport, bigger than football in the 80s. Football was surrounded with lots of problems of hooliganism, hooliganism and vandalism. Snooker was looked so refined. And Red you created Rose. stars, didn't you? They, well, they were household names. They became stars. You, look, you need exposure to create stars. Mm. In those days, there was no social media or Instagram or Twitter or you know, TikTok. We had the BBC, but also we had huge numbers of people watching free to air television. And less channels. Just, and Which made it better. There were two. Yeah. Yeah. Channel 4 started to mark. It, it was an amazing stroke of luck, but also to find the best player in the world by chance mm. was another astonishing. Once you get the cards dealt with you, your job is to make the best of the cards you've got. And sometimes you will bluff, sometimes you will you know, be loud and aggressive, sometimes you will raise the ante, push those chips in. Well, we pushed the chips in because I saw a sport that suddenly, suddenly there was queues outside snookles, never seen them before. Mm. Suddenly you couldn't get a table until six o'clock in the evening if you went there at nine o'clock in the morning. And suddenly this little ginger man was knocking over everybody for fun. Mm. It would have actually been easier. And it would have been more of an achievement to fail. I had all the aces. The mm. cards I got dealt was an unbeatable hand. Mm. And when I've got an unbeatable hand, I'm very difficult to beat as well. And the thing about Steve Davis, and you've learned uh, in the other sports, we'll get onto them, boxing, darts, etc., that um, talent is not enough to succeed in. And so Steve, who clearly was talented, but his mental strength was incredible, and his so-called boring style, his methodical way, 
just blew everybody away. Now you've come across a load of mavericks, people's champions, very popular with people, people who clear the bars, which you want as well, yet they haven't achieved what the Davises and the Hendries of the world have. I'm thinking particularly Alex Higgins, I'm thinking Jimmy White. I mean, people were pleased Alex won. People were desperate to see Jimmy win a world title. Desperate. But there's a reason why they didn't go further than maybe they should have done. I think it's a reflection on their lifestyle. I think when, you, when you're involved in... Look, in, in professional sport, today you have to realise that it's more important to be famous than to be good. Yes, you've got to be good. But everyone's at a similar layer. If, if you put in the effort, which they do. Davis was the first professional snooker player in the real world. So he was a corporate animal. Mm. He'd been built to deliver. We did a, an advertising campaign which summed it all up for Minolta copiers. And it was all over Europe with posters of Steve Davis. And all it said was, boringly reliable. People are at ease with that. They know he turns up on time. They know he delivers. And of course, within the soap opera around snooker that we built, with whether it was Dennis Taylor telling jokes, because he was the Irish funny man, whether it was Willie Thorne backing horses because he was the gambler, whether it was Jimmy White being Jack the Lad and something out of a, a, a Shakespeare play or something. Yeah, there was a soap opera of characters, which Davis was the pivotal one, the animal that kept on winning, if you like the Duracell battery that goes on forever. Mm. You had so many connections. But Alex Higgins and Jimmy White were the, definitely the fans' favourite. You can't ignore the fans, but the view I took in those days was the game needs Alex Higgins, it needs Jimmy White, and I need them as well. But I don't need them badly enough, or I didn't with Alex. I certainly did with Jimmy. It was another story completely. I couldn't afford to gamble my brand values on a maverick like Alex Higgins. And we got on reasonably well, and he asked a few times to join, and I politely said, Alex, the game needs you, I don't. Mm. And that was how we worked. You mentioned Dennis Taylor, um, uh, TV, the popularity of the sport, 1985, for those of you a little bit younger, bear with us, because um, the, the, the final of all finals, uh, Dennis Taylor, Steve Davis, Steve Davis was the favourite. And as we all know, it went down to the final, the final black from the final frame. It's way past midnight, ridiculous TV audiences. Your man Davis loses, mm. but your sports snooker wins. 18 and a half million people watching live after midnight is a number that has never been even approached. And of course, my reaction as a businessman and one for the moment, two days later, I signed Dennis Taylor. It was a classic moment that both Taylor and Davis have been living off for nearly 40 years, you know. And, of course, the younger audience, they, they might read about it, but it was one of those pivotal moments where snooker was officially crowned the king, the king of sports in the UK. We've never reached that level of before. Proliferation of TV channels means you don't ever see that type of number. But the fact is that that game summarise where snooker had, had got to. Mm. And from there, the next job really with snooker was to say, we've conquered the UK, now it's time to conquer the world. And uh, yeah, we've been watching the Ryder Cup um, uh, recently and uh, fantastic players, it's an incredible, shows incredible mental strength to pull off some of the shots they did. Davis, best player in the world, at the time arguably the best player in history, and, and Taylor. You were there. I mean, that, that last frame, that they could have they could have hit a barn door with the proverbial banjo, no. could they? they? Hour, hour and five minutes. Impossible to watch the last few <laughs> minutes. I remember looking behind the curtain at the crucible. They had a curtain when yeah. you enter, and Davis had the black to cut back into the bottom pocket to win. Which, which he which he get thirty nine out of forty times. Forty nine out of fifty probably times. Probably thirty five out. Of it. it was yeah. uh, it was it wasn't as easy as it looked in retrospect, but of course it's one you'd expect to get. Yeah. And uh, I remember saying to my driver, a character called Robbo Brazier, who's interesting that his grandson's on Strictly Come Dancing at the moment, oh, cool. which is how funny how these people yeah. emerge. Yeah. Um, I remember saying to Robbo, I can't watch. Tell me he's got it. 
and I heard the click and I heard the sigh of the audience and I thought, days, you've bloody missed. <laughs> and that was it and it was carnage after that. But look, it's the game. It's not the individuals. The individuals, Davis has benefited by losing that, if you like. At the time, Absolutely. he was in danger of making snooker boring yeah. because he won all the time. We used to walk out of tournaments, people would boo. And Steve would turn around and say, why are they booing me? I'm just doing my best. And I said, because you win everything. Yeah. And the British public, they want to build a winner, they want to knock him down. Yeah. And in their minds, 85 final knocked him down. He came back and, of course, won a few more world titles yeah. after that. So it wasn't the end of his world. So we mentioned Steve Davis, we mentioned Stephen Hendry, uh, uh, you know, Ray Reardon, of course, I think won five world titles, Joe Davis, Fred Davis, uh, etc. Um, but whenever I speak to snooker players, and I know what you're going to say, I ask them, who, in your opinion, is the greatest of all time? And all of them, and that includes Davis and Hendry, yeah. say one name. Ronnie well, O'Sullivan, there's no doubt about it in my mind either. You know, as a player, I don't think we've seen anything close to what Ronnie can produce. It's frightening. I mean, a 147 break in a little over five minutes, the number of world titles is one. I mean, he is a once in a lifetime talent, and you have to applaud him. Right handed, left handed, he's a character. He's got everything that And he's wants. a character as well. He's, he's, a, he's a maverick, isn't he? He is a maverick. We don't see eye to eye on lots of things, but seldom. Well, I've always learned the lesson. Don't expect normality from geniuses, because if they were normal, they wouldn't be a genius. Mm. So you have to take it on the chin. The game would be poorer without him. I think he's in his 40s now, mid 40s. He's not going to last forever, but my word, he seems capable. He just won in Shanghai a few weeks ago against the top players in the world. Who's to say he doesn't go on for another 10 years? Mm. You always were a fight fan. Um, how did you get into boxing and why did you get into boxing? By the way, it's worked out okay, but in the early days, what made you do it? I always liked fights. Uh, I mean, as a youngster living on a council estate, fighters from my background were our heroes because they were ordinary people. It's a great story. It's the same as we're talking all the time about soap operas. Mm. Fighters become community heroes. And I was a fight fan. I, I remember listening to uh, Archie Moore against Rocky Marciano, of course. The first fight I ever listened to. I was seven or eight years old. And, and subsequently, the great Ali came into my world and we all fell in love with him. Funny enough, the first fight I listened to with Ali was against Archie Moore as well. Yeah. So fighters went on for some time. They were heroes. You'd see them on the Patho News. And I grew up wanting to be heavyweight champion of the world. But when I had my chance, I realised I wasn't very good, which was a bit of a career setback in a physical sport. I became a fight fan, and I love fighters. I just love fighters. I love the fact that they were on their own, that they had to dedicate their lives, they had to train beyond anything I'd seen before. So they became my superheroes. But then I didn't think the fights that I used to go to watch were superhero fights. There was the occasional big one, but most of it was pretty rubbish. And I would go and buy a ticket, watch it out, walk out at the end of the day saying that what just wasn't value for money. Mismatches, mainly mismatches. I went to one show at Royal Albert Hall. They called it the Night of the Mexican Road Sweepers. I think there was five first round knockouts. These kids couldn't fight. So I thought to myself, again, there's an opportunity. I did a couple of small shows with Terry Lawless. And then I decided to roll the dice. I went for the big one. Bruno versus Bugner. October 87, White Hart Lane. I can still remember the adrenaline rush you got being involved. I didn't know what I was doing, that's all. But I blacked it, made a lot of money. But more importantly, got the bug badly for putting on shows. People like me, you know, we're not, we're not the shy, retiring types. We're up front. Mm. You uh, took a big risk there, didn't you, I financially? Took a, you took a colossal risk. Yeah. But you know, it's not so much a colossal risk when you haven't got anything. Mm. You know, it's only a risk when you've got money. These days, I'm much more conservative. Mm. But when I was poor, when I was starting off, it wasn't a risk. What was my downside? My dad was a bus driver. I could be a bus driver. It was not, mm. you know, I'm not a failure because I hadn't achieved anything. Mm. 
But nevertheless, once you've got well, into it, it would be a failure if you hadn't tried to achieve it in the first but place. The, the thing is, different type of people take different type of chances. Some people want to be a priest. Some people want to be a nurse. Some people want to be an accountant. Mm. You know, some people want a steady job. And it's, that's never been my way. You know, I've seen opportunity. I can't turn away from opportunity because I don't know where that would lead me. And I love the journey in life where there are unknowns. Mm. I mean, I'm, at the moment, I'm resurrecting and improving the life of Nine Ball Paul, which is the game from the Hustler and Minnesota Facts and all those great characters. I'm putting 101% in it because I feel there's an opportunity. I think I'm right, but I could be wrong. But that's, mate, isn't that what makes life more exciting? You mentioned White Hart Lane, uh, uh, Bruno Bugner, obviously the people's champion Bruno against yeah. the you know, guy from living in Australia, the old man, who, never forgiven for beating Henry Cooper. Never. So you, you did that on purpose of a good guy, Always. bad guy, good cop, bad cop. It was a soap opera. Yeah. It was just another who shot JR episode. Yeah. You know, what's going to happen? And the whole nation behind Frank, mm. quite right, in the BBC had plugged a lot of very bad fights with him. His early fights were horrible to watch, you know, because they were mismatches as well. But he'd come on, he was ready for the next stage. Boom, everyone hated, you know, did you beat Henry Cooper? Who, who, you know, Harry Gibb, who gave the result, you know, never ever got over it in his lifetime. But that's what you need. You need a good guy, bad guy. It's a pantomime. And that sells tickets and that gets media and that gets audience. Funnily enough, although it was only 10 o'clock at night, we hit the same audience for that as we did for the snooker we've just discussed. 18 and a half million people watched it. And I thought, Boxing was a doddle. You just make good fights, you put it on, and everyone gives you a load of money. And then I spent the next seven years realising I didn't know much about boxing at all, and I lost millions trying to find out, trying to find out how to become a good promoter. I think I got there in the end, but it was a, a painful experience. Uh, I was there, and I know you were there, 1991 White Hart Lane, Michael Watson, yeah. uh, Chris Eubank, um, and uh, you know Michael was severely dead. In fact, I changed the face of the one positive, I guess, is that it changed the face of medical care at boxing. Yeah. Actually, Michael came on stage at the Sporting Club Sports Awards yeah. dinner last December, brought the house down, yeah. did a few, threw a few punches, lent into the microphone, he's, he's a fat said, I've still got it, pandemonium, everybody up. Fabulous character, great man. But a, but a dark day, a dark night for you. Yes, it was a dark night. Michael probably wouldn't say that. Because as far as he's concerned, he won the fight. Yeah. I mean, he battered Eubank for nine rounds. He did, yeah. He dropped Eubank. I'd never seen Eubank on the floor before. It was all over, but Eubank, the warrior that he was then, you know, summoned something up and, and it just, one punch changed the life of Michael Watson and changed boxing. You know, boxing is now, because of Michael Watson, a lot safer sport, the medical, clauses and contracts that you have to enter into, make it as, it's never gonna be completely safe, but it makes it safer. And that safer attitude probably saved the likes of Spencer Oliver and other people that have had serious brain problems with boxing because of the treatment they got and the speed of that treatment, they came through it okay. For Michael, he didn't come through it okay, but in a strange world, He's a, he's a piece with himself, mm. you know. He's there he a, is, he is. He's a remarkable man. He is, he is. Um, of all the fighters that you've uh, uh, shared a journey with, if you like, what's been the most enjoyable journey for you? Well, it has to be you, Bank, because again, my life was in turmoil during the mid, eight, mid to late 80s. We were in a recession. There was no TV hours available. There was no sky which people don't realise, the youngsters listening to this may not realise the difference that Sky TV's arrival had on the British sports scene. So it was all going pear-shaped, to be perfectly honest with you. There were no sponsors, there were no TV hours, but I still, I still was doing events. I still had this dream that I wanted to be a promoter of the masses, the people. I wanted to deliver life-changing moments for sportsmen and women, but it was costing me badly. And by the late 80, well, by 89, 
it was touch and go if I was going to go bust. I owed the banks millions and millions of pounds, 17% interest. Oh my God, I had a horrible time. I, I kept it to myself, I bottled it up, I did what a man should do, still looked after my family, but it was taking a terrible price on me. And I was like a fighter coming out for the championship rounds. I'd had enough. And a few things happened in that year. And one of them, obviously, was Eubank fighting Nigel Ben, one of the greatest fights I've ever seen, which gave me a champion and a very popular champion or someone who could sell out arenas. And we started on this amazing 20 plus world title fights, which I think I kept my money. I think Eubank lost his, but, but we were very close. I was best man at his wedding. I value him as a friend now. Uh, but they, they were so excited. And actually, Matram was a company which started in 82 as a hundred pounds company. I put down 60 quid for 60% for me, 20 pound for Eddie, who was three, 20 pound for Katie, who was five. If you'd had a word of me, I would have given you a tenner. I know, I know. Well, they've done quite well out of it, I have to say. <laughs> but more importantly, the journey has been something which I hope has helped millions of hundreds of thousands of sportsmen and women around the world. Most importantly, the millions of sports fans mm. put a smile on their face yeah. and let them see something that's done on a level playing field where the best man wins. Sport absolutely draws the whole country together as nothing else. Yeah. And for that, we should always be grateful. We should realise how much we owe the sportsmen and women for that entertainment. Now, I know you've dabbled with lots of other sports as well, mm. but, but the, the one... Final sport I want to talk to you about, uh, the, the big one, it is darts. And for me, well, we all remember back in the 70s, you know, uh, it, was, it was cigarettes, it was beer, yeah. it was overweight, big sideburns. I remember that, you remember the, the nine o'clock news sketch yes. where, where they're, going for, that's right, they're going for the double vodka and the, and yeah. the single gin. And, yeah. and it was funny, but it was also a reflection. And yeah. enter Barry Hearn, and now you've got. Um, number one, the levels are ridiculous. Number two, you're filling Ali Pali with thousands of berserk people mm. and lots of celebrities all going nuts about the darts. It's now a big occasion, it's a huge TV sport, and you managed to change dusty, smoky pubs mm. to big arenas. How did you see that when you started off thinking, I'm going to change darts? The first time I walked into the circus tavern, I looked around, see seven or eight hundred people with about a six foot ceiling, smoke everywhere, everyone with a pint in their hand, everyone chatting with their mates or chanting, watching some of the darts, not all of it. And I thought, I feel at home here. This was where I came from. It was ordinary people having a good night out. Simplistic. Common sense says that that's a very good foundation to build the mansion on. And my word, we didn't put up a mansion, we put up a palace. The players are earning millions a year, the prize money's gone from half a million to about 20 million, it's changed people's lives, but most important, it's become the second biggest sport for audiences on Sky. It sells out 90,000 tickets at Alexander Palace in 15 minutes. It's a phenomenal sport. But why did it become there? Because we went back to basic common sense values. We have to give customers value for money and we have to give them a customer experience that makes them go home and say, I've had an amazing night at the darts. The fascinating thing about darts is we didn't build it to say, come and watch Michael Van Gogh. Come and watch Phil Taylor. We built it to say, come and have a night at the darts. When you buy your ticket, you have no idea. You have no idea who's playing. We haven't done the draw. When you go there, it's the only sport in the world that's not visible by the naked eye. And yet, we did a show in Schalke Football Stadium in Germany. 22,000 people turned up to watch four ordinary guys throw arrows at a circular object. It, this sport is a phenomenon. It's bigger than boxing for matrimon. That's, that's the importance of it. But more importantly is, we are spreading the game globally 
And over the next five to 10 years, I believe it will hit the levels of golf because it's delivering key market, target market audiences to sponsors. It's delivering ratings that puts a smile on the face of TV executives. And it's producing fan levels where everybody's leaving with a smile on their face. Mm. And you mentioned Feel the Power Taylor. Is Feel the Power Taylor, for all the other darts players you've dealt with over the years, mm. is he your Steve Davis, yes. your Chris Eubanks? Without a doubt. Without a doubt. And again, that same conversation used to come up. The PDC in those days was called Phil's Dark Club because he won everything. But how do we fill his shoes when he leaves? Everyone used to say, this is all very well. Even the TV executives at Sky, this is all very well. But what are you going to do when Phil Taylor retires? What are we going to do? We're going to bring in Michael Van Gogh. We're going to bring in Gerwin Price. We're going to bring in Gary Anderson. We're going to bring in Nathan Aspinall. The, the names just roll off the tongue. What these young players did, Derwin Price is another great example of a rugby player that became a dark player. These players learned from Phil Taylor of the effort they had to go into being the best. So whereas Eric Bristow won the World Championships with an average in the high 80s, if you don't throw 100, 110, you've got no chance. And the standard has gone up, the appreciation of the crowd has gone up. They realise this is a tough game to master and the pressure that's on you is enormous. But then you see people developing from communities, again, where I come from, and they, became, they become local heroes to that community. And they're not earning Premier League money because that's a, football is another issue altogether. But these guys can earn a couple of million a year. That's... We we'll call that good wages. That's good wages. And they have a lifetime span a lot longer than most sports. I think Gary Anderson won a players tournament last weekend, or no, last week. Uh, what was he? 52? Yeah. There's life in the old dog yet. Mm. But they have to live the right life. They have to learn from the great man. Mm. Phil Taylor. I used to say to him, how do you get so good? He said, I just go to work, boy. I just go to work. I clock on at nine o'clock. So then I'll do four hours till lunchtime. I'll have me an hour off for lunch. Then I'll go back on the board in the afternoon. So I'm just doing a shift. But he did it every day. Mm. And that's the, that's the mark of a champion that other people have picked up on and learned. In the same way that Steve Davis educated Stephen Hendry, educated to an extent Ronnie O'Sullivan, because he was a consummate professional. But then people come along and they improve. And when Phil Taylor left, the players that are playing today are better than Phil Taylor was at his peak. And Ron O'Sullivan, I believe, when he passed away, his shoes will be filled as well. It's a natural progression in sport. But I think in my life, it certainly gave me more pleasure than anything else I've done. To take, I mean, snooker's been fabulous for me. Boxing I've loved. I'm loving the nine ball pool. I love my fishing. But darts has been created to produce something special. And slightly weirdly, because he lost a ton of money doing this and mm. probably loads of night sleeps as well, mm. you have always said to me in the past, football, late and orient, <laughs> you loved it. Weirdly, you really? loved it. Well, I'm, I'm a fairly semi-religious, I call myself semi-religious, and I think good Lord's looked after me. He's given me Sky TV. He's given me Steve Davis, Chris Eubank, Michael Van Gogh and Phil Taylor. He's been very kind to me. But I think the man upstairs has got a sense of humour. Right. Because I thought he thinks, let's just throw him a curveball and gave me Leighton Orient. My God. 19 years in the helm of a small football club is one of the most horrible experiences you can have in terms of frustration, aggravation, sleepless nights, lack of success, whatever you want to call it. Finance. But... It has produced a handful of days that make the whole thing worthwhile. And that's the thing. When I lay on my little passageway to heaven, I hope, three of my top ten, there's three of my top ten wonderful moments, and I've had thousands of them, 
will be late nor will be late. You know, I can, I can still close my eyes and see Jonathan Toure slip through the Arsenal defence to fire home an 88th minute equaliser. I still remember the scoring of the goal in the last 15 seconds against Oxford to gain promotion. And yeah. when you think like that... By the way, that 88th minute equaliser against Arsenal meant £1.4 million pounds of gate money from the Arsenal for the replay. Thank you, Jonathan Tour. And people said to me, why are you signing Jonathan Tour? I said, he's a match winner. Yeah. But what I know in football, in bat football, you could write on the back of a packet of cigarettes. It's the most complicated game. It's a complete one-off. And it's impossible to win. So, you know, you can't build a regular sustainable business outside of the Premier League, which is why all clubs are always struggling. But when I sold it, apart from keeping the ground to make sure that, that ground is always there, I also kept a table of 10 in the boardroom for the rest of my life. And it gets used. And I bring my grandchildren and I say, you may like Arsenal, you may like... Real Madrid, there is only one late Norin. Fantastic. To wrap up then, uh, Barry, um, what are the life lessons that you uh, could share with uh, the rest of us? What, what have you learned from a long time on this planet? Uh, what are the key, key lessons that all of us out there uh, trying to make our businesses work and trying to have fun whilst we're doing it? I formed Matrim in 1982 with the purpose of having fun. It was never meant to be a big company, but life just moves in, in strange circles sometimes. You know, opportunities come up and you do need a huge slice of luck on many occasions. What I always say to people is, you know, common sense, just common sense, think it through. People say to me, how do I improve my productivity? I say, it's easy. Start an hour earlier and finish an hour later. Ooh. I haven't seen that written in a book anywhere. Make sure you've got focus in your life to achieve what you want. As I say, everybody in this world is different. Some people want to be a priest, some people want to be a doctor, some people want to be a prison warder, whatever. Some people want to play the game of business and it's really important to know this is a game. We're only here for a few years. When you get to my age, you're fighting to make sure it's a few more years. I treat every business as a game. So what does that mean? I prepare diligently. I sacrifice everything to achieve my goal. I understand winning and losing is a question of profit and loss account and balance sheet. I build sustainability. I'm not after a quick success. When you cut into me, you find common sense. And if you look at businesses, common sense means, are we hitting our target audience? Have we got enough cash in the business to grow at the speed we want to grow? Have we got the right management? The key issue is management. One of my heroes is Warren Buffett. His whole life story is brilliant to read from a business point of view. It's all about management. You can't do it yourself, but you can control it yourself. And make sure you win that bloody match. And you win it by looking, how did I do last year? Now I'm going to do better this year. So the, it's a journey that never ends. Some people are friends of mine. Retired very early, got successful. I don't think they get the fulfilment that we get in terms of we're building a legacy. And whether you're a window cleaner around or whether you're running Shell Oil Company, the same principles of common sense apply. It's not rocket science. Don't make it more complicated than it is. Make sure you graft. Make sure you win that match. Thank you, Barry. Pleasure, mate. Always a pleasure to see you. Good stuff.